My topic is the Paris Agreement goals slipping away and with it Australia's chance to save the Great Barrier Reef. In outline, what I'm going to do is three things. I just want to talk briefly about the Paris Agreement goals and point out that there are paradox. There are paradox in terms of success because if we succeed in achieving them and stabilising the world at 1.5 or 2 degrees, we still fail because we lose the Great Barrier Reef. And that's the second point. We've got expected catastrophic impacts on coral reefs at 1.5 or 2 degrees. So your question would be, well, why would you even set those goals? And then the third point I'll make is Australia, if we want to protect the Great Barrier Reef, we should be fighting like hell for one degree, which is basically the level that we're at now. And with the legacy of past emissions and the inertia in the system, we've still got, even if we could freeze greenhouse emissions now and hold uh, current uh, levels of uh, atmospheric forcing, we'd still have decades of warming, so there's still a legacy now. We're still going to have impacts if we could freeze now, but if we should be fighting for where we're at now, not allowing further increases. So one degree, or 350 parts per million CO2, is really the targets that we should set. So I've written a paper, or an editorial for the latest EPLJ, which basically this presentation is based around if you're uh, interested in a reference. So first point, the Paris Agreement, and you know the goals of, everyone knows the 2 degree and the 1.5 degree famous goals. And we know that Paris was a tremendous success in many ways. At an international level, it was an outstanding success. And compared to the 2009 disaster in Copenhagen, you know, to get to Paris and actually have an agreement of anything was amazing. So, yes, it was a success, but it was also a tragic failure because 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees are lethal for coral reefs and for a whole heap of other ecosystems. I mean, then you're up from Tasmania, a blaze, all of these just breaks my heart to look at Tasmania at the moment and so many other ecosystems. But I'm going to focus, keep focusing on the GBR, so success and failure. And, you know, we get there's still this widespread misconception that two degrees isn't very much, but what we're talking about with a two degree mean rise is a shift in the entire distribution of temperature. And we actually have evidence of that happening. So this is from just the state of the climate. Basically it's showing in different decades the shift in the entire distribution of temperature in Australia. And so we shift in the entire distribution and it's the extremes that kill corals and, and things like the heat waves that you know this is a graph of frequency of extreme heat events is increasing that's the extreme that's the tail of the whole distribution but it's shifting the entire distribution so it's the extremes that are the killers so this is a picture of the Californian wildfires could easily show a picture of Australian wildfires as well it's the extremes that kill us and so what are the expected impacts on the GBR of rising mean global temperatures and shifting the whole bloody distribution of temperature by 1.5 to two degrees in the context where we've already warmed by about basically one at the moment. Well, bloody disastrous is the answer. So you know about coral bleaching. So corals are a symbiosis between an animal and a plant. If corals exceed their thermal tolerance and basically they're in water that's too hot for them, the animal kicks out the plant and the plant is what holds the pigments and does the photosynthesis. And so when the plant is kicked out, corals look like they've been bleached white. So this is a split image of corals in American Samoa. On the left, you see it's an acropora coral, so it's basically a brownie sort of coral. And then the image on the right is the same patch of reef when it's been bleached. So bleached corals, they start white, but they don't stay white. So when they're dead, they get covered in algae. So this is a series of images of the same patch of reef on Polaris Island in the GBR, killed in the 98 mass coral bleaching event. That's the image on the left, so white then four years later covered in algae. Another couple of years on though, it was starting to recover. So if you can actually see down the bottom of that, there's like an acropora coral, so it's coming back. So if you only ever had one bleaching event, the reef would recover. The problem is we're gonna get repeated bleaching events and more frequent bleaching events. And we now have had four mass coral bleaching events on the GBR, 98, 2002, 2016, and 2017 all catastrophic and it's the 26 well it was clear in the 98 
bleaching event and the 2002 events that being in a pristine environment for a reef didn't really help you because even in those bleaching events, reefs on outer reefs bleached as well like on the Swains, so the relatively pristine water. But the 2016 event brought that really home. You see there in the 2016 event the whole northern section which is the most pristine has the least amount of agriculture in the coast. All of that got bleached. That's the pristine environment. So that led uh, Terry Hughes and his team uh, in a famous paper in Nature basically to say there's no, hypo no support for the hypothesis that good water quality confers resistance to bleaching, which would be a shock to government policy which is all based around improving water quality to protect the reef. Well, there's no evidence that that actually bloody works. And I give the analogy, it's, it's not that improving wa water quality isn't a good thing, it's just that you know that as a healthy person, okay, you're pretty healthy, but if someone walks up with a shotgun and shoots you in the chest, you're going to die. Okay, well, it's mass coral bleaching events are the same as putting a shotgun to the reef and shooting it in the heart. It's going to die. So, yeah, protection, pretty well nothing saves it other than don't boil it to start with. Now, it's not like we haven't known this. It's not like, you know, this was just a shock last year that this, we've known this since really 98. Ove Hugh Goldberg put out a famous paper Professor at UQ, famous coral reef ecologist, put out a paper in 99 that basically said this is what is going to happen and what we're seeing now is what he predicted. And so in the fourth assessment report in 2007, so over a decade ago, IPCC, IPCC saying at one to three degrees warming, coral reefs are basically going to experience more widespread breach, bleaching. The Grumper Again, there's been heaps more reports since then, but I just focus on 2007 because that was the first time Grumper really said coral reefs at two degrees are stuffed. So that was a decade ago. And that's, that's our government agency. So there's famous papers like this one in Nature Climate Change, two degrees, they're stuffed. But when Paris occurred, all the work was based around two degrees. So when Paris occurred, you know, you had a thought, well, well is 1.5 degrees going to be better? And the answer from the IPCC fourth uh, special report on 1.5 that just came out last October is no, not really. So this is from the special report last October. Basically says coral reefs are projected to climb by a further 70 to 90 percent at 1.5, and larger losses over 99 percent at 2 degrees. Now that's 70 to 90 percent on top of already losing 50 percent. It's not like starting, that's not like 70 to 90 percent total, that's going from the current point where we've lo already lost half. So basically, yeah, coral dominated ecosystems will be non-existent at two degrees or higher. And yeah, 1.5 is not that much better. Now we can say, well, going beyond four degrees or something was literature on that, you know, that's even more catastrophic. But I mean, if the reef is dead at three degrees, three degrees, it's also dead at four degrees, it's not that much better for the reef. So yes, Paris is better than the alternative of four or six or eight, but for reefs they'll be gone well before those levels. So if we actually wanted to protect the reef, imagine the world where our government actually wanted to protect the reef and was based on evidence. So. Paul, Martin and I talk about you know, evidence-based policy making and, and evaluating based on objective facts. If we actually did that, you wouldn't go beyond one degree and 350 parts per million. Like, that's what the evidence says. So, and everyone knows the 350 parts per million from Hansen's famous paper in 2008, a very famous paper, it spawned Bill McKibben's 350.org uh, organisation, but yeah, we didn't get uh, any. We didn't get any traction really at a global level on that. No one is prepared to say we can't go further than we currently are when the evidence is saying we can't. But global governments are, and our government aren't prepared to actually stop. Now, I'm going to say frankly, I don't know if we can reduce atmospheric CO2 to 350 parts per million and stabilise global temperatures at one degree. I don't know. The point I would make is it's the right goal. It's what we should be trying for. It should be Australian government policy. We want to protect the reef. 
We need one degree. We need 350 parts per million. We are going to stop our coal exports. We are going to do everything we can to protect these ecosystems because our lives depend upon it. Because they bloody do. So the paradox is Paris was both an amazing success and a tragic, catastrophic failure. Under the Paris Agreement, we have agreed to destroy the Great Barrier Reef. Think about that. We have agreed to destroy the most amazing ecosystem we have that, that generates 50,000 jobs a year and billions of dollars worth of income for us, food. We've agreed to destroy it. And if I sound angry, I bloody damn. And these dickheads Scott Morrison and this stupid bloody energy minister that we have laugh that we're going to meet the Paris agreements at a canter. They just make me sick. They're delayers, they're acting in bad faith. They are, it's just incredibly... And, and I ask my classes this, because I, I live next to a railway line and I get coal trains coming past about six times a day. We are really good at counting our emissions. We know exactly how much we're emitting. We know exactly how much coal we're exporting. We know what that is doing. And a, a few years ago, there was a, a, a story about a man in Germany, 93 year old man, he'd been a bookkeeper in Auschwitz and he was put on trial for being party to genocide. And I often think, we are the bookkeepers at Auschwitz. We are really good at keeping stock of where we're going and how much we are polluting. We know exactly what we're doing and we are doing it anyway. So to wrap up, the Paris Agreement is a paradox for success. If we succeed, we fail. At 1.5 or 2 degrees, uh, we have catastrophic impacts on coral reefs and we should be setting a one degree target, 350 parts per million. If we are serious about protecting the Great Barrier Reef, we should set those goals. And yeah, just governments, if they're going to, you know, the, the bullshit about we're going to get, meet our Paris Agreement at a canter, that should be followed by, oh, and by the way, we, we meet it at a canter, sure, but the Great Barrier Reef won't be there. Is that okay with you? Because that should be the, the, the caution on Paris Agreement goals. But you'll never hear that from our Prime Minister and no doubt not from our next Prime Minister either. And it is a, not just a scandal, it is a tragedy. It makes Brexit and the catastrophe that's happening in the UK, it makes Brexit look like the world's best policy, like it is a, a fantastic going tremendously smoothly. Brexit is just this disaster. What we're doing on climate makes it look like an absolute success.